Welcome to the Ohio Fire Service Hall of Fame. Please direct your attention to the exits at the front and rear of the gallery. In the event of emergency, we are all in good hands. It is now my pleasure to introduce our MC for the afternoon from WBNS 10 TV. Let's give a warm welcome to Angela Pace. How are you? Do we have anybody who was here last year? A couple of people? All right, so I promise I will behave better this year than I did last year. Actually, I'm amazed I'm back this year. And now we go back to the script. Good afternoon, and welcome to the 42nd Annual Ohio Fire Service Hall of Fame and Fire Awards. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the Ohio State Highway Patrol Drum and Bugle Corps for the wonderful music leading us into today's event. Okay, guys, I have a request for next year. So you got a whole year to practice. Next year, I'd like to hear some Motown, some Chicago, and some Sinatra. Okay? You have a year. I'll buy the sheet music. There you go. I love listening to these guys, though. They do a great job and kind of get us in the right frame of mind for today's event. I am. Truth be told, Angela Pace from WBNS 10 TV. You may applaud wildly at this point. I insist on it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My ego needs that. This is my second year hosting this wonderful event. I did have so much fun last year that I didn't think I'd be invited back, but I am glad that I was. Some of my favorite people on the planet are firefighters and EMTs. I have a lot of friends from my early days as a reporter here in Columbus when I was covering fires and all kinds of horrible tragedies, and the firefighters were always the ones who gave me the best sound bites and also were a lot easier to work with. A lot of them became my friends way back in the day, and we became um, happy hour buddies. Uh, many of them, though, have gone on to be, what do you get to be in the fire department? Admirals or generals or whatever y'all get to be. So they are in offices now, but a lot of them have retired. So we spend a lot more time happy houring. So I love having the opportunity to honor these fine. Now we have some other folks who, pair the folks who apparently feel the same way. Some of our elected officials are joining us this afternoon. If you are an elected official, please stand and wave. Don't be shy. Oh, there you go. Wave, wave, and wave. There you go. Thank you. See, you're going to want that recognition when you're running again, okay? <laughs> And the big bosses, the directors of some of our state's you please stand and wave. See how they did that? See how they did that so nicely? So nicely? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. We want to thank all of you for being with us. To begin the program, the chairs of the Ohio Fire Council and the Firefighter and Fire Safety Inspector Training Committee will welcome us. First up, John Finley from the Ohio Fire Council. Thank you. I don't even know how to follow that. So <laughs> maybe you can help me out here. Um, welcome, fellow firefighters and distinguished guests. My name is John Finley, and it is my honor to welcome you all to the annual Ohio Fire Service Hall of Fame and Ohio Fire Awards Ceremony. As president of the State Fire Council, it is a privilege to stand before you today and recognize the hard work, dedication, and sacrifice of our firefighters. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to uh, honor the State Fire Council that serve on the board. Would you stand, please? Thank you. The State Fire Council is, is an advisory body that represents stakeholders throughout the state. The Ohio Fire Council is charged by the General Assembly with officially recognizing and commemorating exemplary accomplishments and acts of heroism by firefighters 
and other persons at fire-related incidents or similar events occurring in Ohio maintaining the Ohio Fire Service Hall of Fame. The State Fire Council was made up of 10 qualified Ohioans appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the Senate. These members represent eight stakeholder groups, including the general public, regulated industries, the fire service, and local government. As we gather here today, we celebrate the bravery and selflessness of our firefighters who have made it their life's work to protect our communities. They put their lives on the line every day, responding to emergencies with speed, courage, and unwavering commitment. Their efforts often go unnoticed, but we are here to acknowledge their heroic deeds and celebrate their accomplishments. The Fire Service Hall of Fame Awards recognizes the outstanding contributions of firefighters who have demonstrated distinguished service, valor, leadership, and commitment to their communities. These awards are a testament to the hard work and dedication of our firefighters and serve as an inspiration to us all. We must remember that our firefighters are not just professionals. They are part of our communities. They are our neighbors, our friends, and family members. They serve tirelessly and selflessly, putting the safety of others before their own. They are true heroes. It is important that we take this opportunity to honor our firefighters and show them our appreciation for all that they do. They work tirelessly to keep us safe, and it is one of the responsibilities of the Fire Council to ensure that their dedication and hard work do not go unnoticed. I urge you all to join me in thanking our firefighters for their service and congratulating the honorees of the Fire Service Hall of Fame Awards. Let us continue to support our firefighters and ensure that their hard work and dedication are recognized and celebrated. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of the Firefighter and Fire Safety Inspector Training Committee, Chief Mark Machetta. Thank you, Chief Finley. I appreciate the opportunity to honor first responders and their selfless work that they do every day. I've seen this firsthand during my more than three decades of service as a firefighter paramedic. I serve as the chair of the State Board of Emergency Medical, Fire, and Transportation Services, and one of our top priorities is to make sure that every EMS provider and firefighter has the training they need to provide Ohioans with top-notch care. You often encounter people at the worst moments of their lives. It's your dedication, compassion, and professionalism that help patients and their family navigate these emotionally challenging moments. Those of you being recognized today went above and beyond. Whether it was showing bravery in the face of danger or devoting years of your life to supporting fire and EMS crews, you no doubt sacrificed time with your own family to protect others. That takes courage and character, which many ordinary people do not possess. We want to thank your families for their sacrifice and their understanding of why the work you do is so important. Without their love and support, these honorees would not be able to give so much of themselves to others. I am honored to be here with you today. I am proud of your dedication to serving the citizens of Ohio. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And now please stand as the Licking County Honor Guard, joined by the Columbus Pipe and Drum Corps, host the colors for today's ceremony.
Thank you very much to the Licking County Honor Guard and the Columbus Pipe and Drum Corps. Let me now direct your attention to the names on the screen. We're going to remember those that we lost in this past year. These names represent the line of duty deaths in the last year. So let's join together in a moment of silence as firefighter Mark Foster of the Columbus Division of Fire Honor Guard comes to the stage to ring the bell and to honor these fallen colleagues. In the past, the lives of firefighters have been closely associated with the ringing of the bell. As they begin their hours on duty, it was the bell that signaled the beginning of the shift. Through the day and the night, each alarm was sounded by a bell that called them to fight fire and to place their lives in jeopardy for the good of their fellow man. When the fire was out and the alarm had been completed, the bell sounded to signal the completion of the call. Philip M. Weigel. Johnny Tetrick. Tracy L. Leach. Wayne B. Bingaman. Thank you, Firefighter Foster. Now join me in welcoming Robert Wagner, the Executive Director of the Ohio Division of EMS, to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And please remain standing as Debbie Liffick from the State Fire Marshal Office performs our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hail through the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled Banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you very much, Debbie. The invocation will now be delivered by Chaplain Larry Foster from the Ohio Federation of Fire Chaplains and Liberty Township Volunteer Fire Department. Good afternoon. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here and I invite you to bow with me and join as we pray. 
Almighty God, we come before you today on this very special occasion. This, a day set aside to recognize the service and sacrifice of our brothers and sister first responders, EMT, firefighters, who have given so much in dedicated service to their calling, some to the very full measure of the ultimate sacrifice. We pray, God, that as we honor those who have fallen and these who remain, that we are moved to greater service and dedication in our own calling. We ask your blessing on these proceedings and on those that we honor, as well as the loved ones who share the honor along with them by their service and support. We thank you, God, for your provision, your protection, your comfort. We are reminded at a time like this of the hymn writer's words, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter in the stormy blast in our eternal home. O oh Lord, may you be our help. May you be our hope. And in you may we find our shelter and look to you as our eternal home. Be with those here today and all of those serving across this globe who are taking their time and risking their lives to rescue and to protect. We pray your blessing upon these proceedings now, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Chaplain. Now, before we get into the individual awards, it's my pleasure to welcome the Director of the Department of Public Safety, Andy Wilson, to the stage. Good afternoon. It's an incredible honor to, to stand here before you and to serve with you as the Director of the Ohio Department of Public Safety. It's an incredible honor to have the opportunity to serve with you uh, on our mission of protecting and keeping Ohioans safe. I come to the Department of Public Safety really from the, the law enforcement criminal justice side. And it's important uh, for us here in Columbus, for the policymakers uh, who are bringing initiatives and rules and, and different policies uh, to the profession, it's, an, it's important for us to put those policies in place in a way that they do no harm to the folks who are in the trenches who have to deal with them. We cannot be putting into place policies or initiatives that make your job harder. And one of the ways we can avoid that is by really getting out in the trenches with you in the public safety space, spending time with you and understanding the challenges that you're facing day to day. To that end, last Monday night, I found myself uh, with Station 4 at the Akron Fire Department. And it was an incredible experience. This was the first time that I had the opportunity to actually to do a, a full ride along with a, with a fire and, and EMS unit. And I, I would, in just a short period of time that I have with you today, like to share uh, an observation of a trait or a characteristic that just jumped off the page uh, at me with respect to the men and women in that, in that station. Now look, there's lots of characteristics that I could talk about this afternoon. I could spend all kinds of time talking about things like courage. We weren't in that station. My started, I hadn't been in there 20, hadn't been in there 20 minutes. And we got a two battalion call for a high rise fire in a low income housing development. And I don't know how many, uh, I don't know how many vehicles, how many trucks and units actually responded, but that tone went off and they went engine, ladder, medic, again and again and again. And one of the things that stood out to me when we got there is uh, there was no hesitation. People jumped off of those trucks and off of those rigs and they were moving with a purpose. And if they were scared or if there was any fear, they didn't show it. The only thing I saw in their eyes was really determination, professionalism. Everybody was moving with a purpose. Now, it wasn't a, it wasn't a real fire. Someone actually had set off some fire extinguishers in, in the place. But I, I guarantee, uh, had that been a real fire, everybody would have been moving that same way. I could talk to you about compassion. All right. The second call we had, we, didn't, we had just left that call. Uh, we got called to a 17-year-old who had been shot in the chest. And as we got there, and I was able to watch that young paramedic work 
uh, with that, that kid, all I saw was care and compassion. She didn't care about the circumstances that the kid had been in. And, and again, she's wearing a bulletproof vest uh, because of the, the nature of the call. She didn't care about his background, what had or hadn't happened. All she cared about was taking care of him. She spoke to him with, with kindness, with humility, and in a caring manner that brought that young man some level of comfort. I could talk to you about compassion and what I saw during that shift all day long. But really the trait that stood out to me that I wanna to talk to you about today is love. I had the opportunity to, to have, there was about an hour lull in, in the shift. I had the opportunity to eat dinner uh, with them and there was a long table and we, we ate at the, the, the table. And for my troopers and if there's any law enforcement in the, uh, in the group, the stereotypes about firefighter dinners are spot on. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing meal. Uh, we had meatloaf and I actually made the mistake, uh, my wife doesn't like to cook, doesn't cook much, but her dish is meatloaf. I made the mistake of when I got home, uh, telling her that that was the best meatloaf that I'd ever had in my, in my life. So uh, less, lesson learned there. But really, uh, really what I appreciated about that time was they took me in. I was a stranger, you know, I'm an outsider. They took me in and they talked to me about runs, they talked to me about their career. And as I was able to listen to them talk, uh, I saw love and, and, and there's different forms of love. And I saw a couple different forms that I wanna talk about. First of all, is the love of humanity and the love for others. Uh, they were telling me a story about a, a run that they had been on where there was somebody in a house. That the, it was a two-story house, house was on fire. They had to go in up to the second floor to get the person out. And as they were telling me the story, they were telling me uh, about purpose and really kind of the, the surface aspects of what they did and, and how they responded. But really, as I peeled back the layers of that story, what, what I realized or what I looked at was the ability to prevent harm to, or the ability to save the life of people you don't even know is the purest form of love of humanity that we have. It, it, it really is. Look, there's no greater love than a willingness to lay down your life for others. And the men and the women that I got to work with that day and the men and the women in this room who are in the profession, those, that's not just a verse, those aren't just words, it's a code of honor, it's a code of conduct that you uphold every day that you come to the station. The second form of love that kind of stood out to me as I talked to them was brotherly love. It was readily apparent, these guys and gals sitting at that table with me telling their stories, they, they work shoulder to shoulder in harm's way, driven by a love for each other, a desire to protect each other, a desire not to let each other down. Look, man, it was, it was palpable that when they, they go on runs, they love each other, care for each other, and protect each other, but it wasn't just the runs. I asked them as we sat at that table, I said, hey, look, when you go on a really bad run and, and you see a child that's been killed or a, a, you know, a, a really traumatic death, like how, do you, how do you deal with that as a group, as a unit? They didn't hesitate. They said, we deal with it right here at this table. They come back from the runs as a group, uh, as a, a, a group of brothers and sisters who have experienced something traumatic and they, they work it out. They talk it out and they said, look, sometimes we find humor in things we shouldn't find humor in. Sometimes uh, we cry, sometimes we laugh, but together we work through it. There was also stories of marriages saved, man. They little, there was a guy that's sitting there said, look, 10 years ago, I was a terrible husband. And my wife and I, we went to, to marriage counseling together, but, but what saved my marriage was my mentors sitting at the table men who had been there before me, who spoke words of wisdom into me, and they saved my marriage. And I'll tell you what, that is love for each other. The final version of love that I saw as I sat there and talked to them was love for the profession. It was clear that they loved the job, they loved their unit, they loved their station, and they loved their department. Look, 95% of them, as I talked to them, I asked all of them where they were originally from, they were from the Akron area. And, and they spoke so highly, they spoke glowingly about the fact that they were able to, to stay there 
and to serve their community. Was there griping? Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we could work, we, we could have a job as an ice cream taster and, and we would complain about uh, your ice cream being too cold, our mouth being too cold at some point. Was there griping? Yes. But man, through it all, there was love for their unit, love for their station profession. And it just spoke volumes, spoke volumes to me about what you do as a career and how you serve your community. So as we walk out of here today, the, the, the takeaway that I'd ask you, uh, those of you in the profession, to, to take with you, not just through all of our words, uh, but through your ability to, to receive awards, your ability to spend time with your brothers and sisters in the profession, your ability to honor those for their uh, valor and for their service. I, it's my hope that when you walk out of here, this experience today reignites or reinforces your love for humanity, your love for each other, and your love for the profession. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director. And you're right about firehouse kitchens. When I was a reporter, I always tried to work on Thanksgiving because I knew I could go to Station 10 on West Broad Street or Station 8 over on Long Street and have the best Thanksgiving dinner ever and then go back to work. Kevin Reardon, did I forget you? <laughs> I think I did this last year too, nothing personal. But at this point, no, actually, you were supposed to introduce him. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get to come back. All right. So at this time, Marshal Kevin Reardon has remarks. Kevin. I know. You've got a history. I know. <laughs> I've got to tell you, before I start my formal comments, I've got to be honest. I haven't been able to sleep the last three nights. Uh, not because I'm nervous. I'm excited. I'm excited and pumped to be here to honor all of our, our honorees that are here today. But I'm also honored to be here as a profession, to have so many people from the fire service represented to celebrate what some of our brothers and sisters are doing all over Ohio. So here we go. Uh, thank you, and, and let me welcome you again to the 42nd Annual Ohio Fire Service Hall of Fame and Fire Awards Ceremony. I especially would like to thank the Director of the Ohio Department of Commerce, Sherry Maxfield, for being with us today. I know she is, I know she is very excited to hand out awards to our firefighters in just a few minutes. <clears throat> we are also happy to have other special guests and elected officials here. We're always pleased to have you here because you honor us with your presence and you get to hear a little bit from us that you probably won't otherwise. This newly revamped program that we've got uh, moved here to COSI last year. Uh, it moved from the fire marshal's office to, from our multi-purpose room to this very facility uh, because we really outgrew that space. We needed a much larger, we needed a better way to honor every doing you all are doing. As I as I look around, I'm so pleased to see how far we have come <clears throat> in such a short period of time. It is incredibly exciting to be sharing fellowship with so many members of the fire service. As the State Fire Marshal of Ohio, I address you today on a matter that is of utmost importance to the safety and well-being of our communities. As we get ready to celebrate all of the truly amazing heroic accomplishments that you all, the fire the fire service, the very service, the very backbone of our state's emergency response system is at a crossroads. We're facing unprecedented challenges that require our urgent attention. One of the biggest challenges we currently face is the aging workforce of our fire service. Many of our dedicated firefighters are approaching retirement age, and their experience and their expertise cannot be easily replicated. Their invaluable contributions to our communities cannot be overstated or underestimated. And we owe them our deepest gratitude for their selfless service. However, as these experienced firefighters retire, we are facing a shortage of recruits in their place. The younger generation seems to be less inclined to join the fire service. And this shortage of staffing 
is putting a strain on our resources and impacting our ability to respond to emergencies in a timely manner. Moreover, the fire service is also struggling with limited resources. Budget constraints and competing priorities have made it challenging to adequately fund and equip many of our fire departments. This lack of resources has a direct impact on the safety of our firefighters and the quality of the service that we can provide to our communities. I must share with you one more challenge that we are experiencing in Ohio, and most of you already probably know what I'm going to talk about the volunteer fire service. As I travel throughout the state, I hear the struggles of the volunteer fire service everywhere I go. Equipment costs, staffing issues, declining financial resources, they're straining the ability of some volunteers to provide even the most basic level of service. Here in Ohio, roughly 70% of our 1,180 fire departments are volunteer departments, protecting 11 and a half million Ohioans Ohioans rely on volunteers as their first level of defense in emergency away from our urban areas where the volunteer departments are most common. As a career firefighter, I know the fire service is rooted deeply in tradition, but the challenges of today can only be addressed through forward thinking and innovative solutions. There's no single greatest issue of concern. There are many. And together, they are creating challenges we've never seen before. This is not only an Ohio issue. Sadly, it's also a national problem. Nationwide, same issues. But Ohio, I believe, can and will serve as an example. The volunteer fire service has many challenges. The need for adequate funding, proper equipment, proper resources, along with sufficient personnel to properly respond. In the spring of 2022, Governor DeWine created a task force to look at the very issues within the Volunteer Fire Service. This group is spearheaded by the Ohio Department of Commerce, chaired by me, prized of local officials from throughout the state, throughout the state and firefighters from many different disciplines. I'm thankful that Governor DeWine recognized these challenges and acted forming the Ohio Task Force on the Volunteer Fire Service and listening to our report recommendations to implement change quickly and decisively. The task force provided a 32-page report re-emphasizing Ohio's leadership in protecting our state's citizens. It is available at a table in the back corner, and I would encourage all of you to please take a copy. This task force report provides a roadmap to continue improving the critical services that our first responders provide to Ohio's communities. But despite these challenges, the fire service remains the noblest professions that holds a special place in the hearts of all Ohioans. Our firefighters are the everyday heroes who put their lives on the line to protect our communities without question and without hesitation often risking their very lives to save those of others and property. You are the ones that rush into the burning buildings, rescue people from car accidents, and provide emergency medical care during critical situations. The fire service is not just a job. It is a calling, it's a passion, it's a commitment to serve others for your life. It requires courage, resilience, and selflessness. Our firefighters embody these very qualities and deserve our unwavering support. As a state fire marshal, I am committed to addressing these challenges head on. I will work tirelessly to advocate for increased funding and for resources for our fire departments to create some initiatives that will promote recruitment and retention of firefighters and to raise awareness about the importance of the fire service in our communities. So as we gather today to celebrate our honorees and those other firefighters and fire stations throughout Ohio, let us not forget about the challenges that lie before us. Let us not hope that the passing of time will make these challenges go away. Let us resolve to commit to work together through every community in Ohio to seek solutions to these challenges. 
the lives of 11 and a half million Ohioans are counting on us to be there for them in their darkest hour. Let's not let them down. I also want to take a moment to encourage all of our fire departments to take advantage of a valuable resource that is now available to you, and it's called makemeafirefighter.org. This website was launched by the National Volunteer Fire Council and is designed to make it easier for prospective volunteers to learn about available opportunities in their communities and to connect them with fire department services. Whether you're, a whether you're a volunteer or a career firefighter, you can benefit from the Make Me a Volunteer campaign. Using this website, you can increase your department's visibility in the community to attract new volunteers. You can also take advantages of the tools and resources that are available on the website to better engage with the community and to recruit volunteers. The Make Me a Firefighter campaign is particularly important because the majority of fire departments in the United States are volunteers. These volunteers serve in a variety of ways from fighting fires and responding to medical emergencies to assisting during natural disasters and conducting fire safety education. By using makemeafirefighter.org, you can help ensure that your department has the volunteers it needs to keep your community safe. I strongly encourage all firefighters to make meafirefighter.org and explore the resources that are available to you. By using the website, you can help ensure that your department has volunteers to serve the community into the future. I urge all Ohioans to recognize the critical role that our firefighters play and to support them in every possible way. If you or someone you know is willing and able, urge them to become a volunteer firefighter or a career firefighter. If you're in a position of influence, support policies and initiatives that prioritize the needs of our fire departments. And if you see a firefighter in your community, express your gratitude and appreciation for their unwavering service to the community. In conclusion, the fire service in Ohio is at a crossroads, but I am confident that with our collective efforts, we can overcome these challenges and continue to ensure the safety and well-being of our communities throughout Ohio. Our firefighters deserve our support and recognition for their invaluable service, and I'm committed to working tirelessly to uphold the profession of the fire service in the great state of Ohio. Thank you, and now let me turn things back over to our MC. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'm sorry, Marshall, Kevin. We are also very pleased to be joined today by the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Ohio, John Hewson, who has agreed to join us on the stage to help us present the awards. Lieutenant Governor? Oh, you're there? When did you get there? I was supposed to announce you and then escort you up the stairs. Thank you. <laughs> I have lost control of this entire program. <laughs> and now what we're all here for, that is to honor the Ohio Fire Service Hall of Fame award winners and division of EMS honorees. Now we produced videos for each of the honorees telling their stories and celebrating their efforts. Then after you learn more about their brave work, they will join us at the front of the room for the award presentation and a photo. So first up, the Ohio Citizens Award. This award goes to members of the public who, at great personal risk to themselves, are credited with directly saving or attempting to save the lives of others during an extreme fire or emergency rescue situation. We begin with the story of Jorge or George Raggianti, who risked his life twice, twice, to rescue children from a burning car. So I could tell that it was going to be a little more of an urgent call, uh, just in the tone of the dispatcher's voice. She was uh, speaking a lot faster, a little more frantic. Car 2 and 2 truck 1 to the rear of Rise, 18607 Detroit for a car on fire. There was potentially a child trapped inside. 
suspect. I had uh, a CAD note that said that there might have been two children. And the day of the incident, I was working in the parking lot of the store that I was assigned to for that day. Someone approached me and told me that there was excessive smoke coming from a car parked in the lot of the store. At that moment, I ran towards the car to see what was going on. When I got to the car, I saw a lot of smoke and fire inside the car. I could see there was a little boy who was sitting in the front passenger seat of the car. I tried to punch and break the glass, but I couldn't. So I decided to run to my car and get the wrench in the back of my car. I was able to pull the little boy out of the car in flames. He opened the door and pulled the first child from the burning vehicle. And then that is when the first child told George that his brother was still in the car. I think that George didn't even think twice about it. It was just an instinct for him that he noticed that a child was in danger and he leapt into action. I think it took him less than 10 seconds to return to his car to get the tire iron and run back to the vehicle that was on fire to rescue the children. After I pulled the little boy out of the car, I proceeded to place him on a safe place away from the car on fire. At this point, I was not feeling well. Then I realized that the toxic fumes from the burning car had gotten to me. Suddenly, I heard the crying and screaming of a second child coming from the car. Without hesitation, he went back to the car to get the second child. He opened every door, just searching for the child. and finally pulled him to safety. I had seen uh, Mr. Raggianti kind of wandering around, uh, almost dazed after what had happened. And I noticed that all the skin on his arms were burned and, and sloughing off. There was fire and smoke and heat, and he reached back in there without any gear on, without regard to any of his own safety or his life, and he pulled that second child out. And in the video you see, it's not Five, six, seven seconds later, well, the whole car is full of flames. What I saw on that video footage was nothing short of being a true hero. And without George's actions of that day, those children wouldn't be here today. Amazing. Jorge Ragianti is here with us today. Would you please come up and accept your award? Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. I'd kind of like to have you like just follow me around because I have, I have ways of getting into trouble. Congratulations, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get security in here, please? <laughs> the Ohio Fire Service Valor Award is given to members of the fire service in the state of Ohio who, at great personal risk to themselves, are credited with directly saving or attempting to save a life during an emergency situation above and beyond the normal line of duty. Now we kick off our Valor Awards with two videos representing two separate incidents for the Coleraine Fire Department, the same fire department, two incidents. So we're gonna watch them both and then bring up our awardees. So first up is a Daring River Rescue. Watch this. So we got dispatched for a person hanging on a tree in the river. Uh, the river conditions were honestly perfect for recreational kayaking. The incident escalated early. The radio traffic we were getting from first on scene units, they had told us that he was going under, that he was caught in a strainer, that he was going under multiple times. What made it difficult was the river split. We were on one side of it 
and it merged together again right above the victim. So it had a very turbulent current there. It changed the way the boat felt. It changed the way everything acted. It kept turning our boat around. We could not operate the boat, and we were worried about slamming into the debris pile, us getting stuck or knocking the victim further into the debris pile. So what happened was when we rounded the bend, victim go on. He saw the victim go underwater and I thought I just watched him go under for the last time. Facing downstream I couldn't control the boat. So I spun it around facing upstream and immediately at that point I just said you guys are gonna have to go. You guys need to go go get him. That's our last option is for firefighters to exit the boat to go into the water. Immediately we knew that it was going to be a very fast-paced rescue. Me and Tyler exited the boat I had a good plan of swimming to a safe distance away from the victim to talk to him to get him to calm down because of the current. That as soon as I reached the log, he lunged for me and did start immediately pushing us underwater. He grabbed a hold of both of them, pulled them under in both, uh, you know, multiple instances. And I'm maintaining a rope bag with one hand and the boat motor with the other hand. I didn't have enough hands to get to my radio. I couldn't call for help. Honestly, you know, I think me and Tyler were scared. To be you know, we were trying everything possible and we both worried that we weren't going to be able to execute this, this rescue because it was not going well for the first couple of minutes. And again, he was just doing it out of survival. But I could tell by the look on my guy's faces that it was a really bad situation. I would say that key factors for us in success were the additional mutual aid companies that were there. We, we could not have done it with all the resources, but you know, especially with Cincinnati. To hear that familiar voice, to say, hey, how can I help you? You know, it really was a great relief because we were struggling and we were tired. Um, after we got him into the boat, me and Tyler both kind of held onto a log for a minute just to catch a breath. You know, we did both did swallow a decent amount of water and coughed out some of the water. Talk about a risk management plan. We will risk our lives in a calculated manner to save a saveable life. And in this instance, they did exactly that. Amazing. So the firefighters in the Colerain Fire Department have been very, very busy. They have definitely earned their keep this year. They were also nominated for a second act of valor last year, and this time those firefighters, a lot of them the same firefighters, faced a domestic-turned-hostage situation. The police got called out for a custody dispute with the child between the parents, the mom and the dad. The dad had taken the child in the upstairs bedroom. The officer was not able to retrieve the child, and he called for SWAT, that we had a hostage situation with a gunman, a known gunman. And that's what started it all off. When the police showed up and went upstairs, he started shooting at him, And then shortly after that, he had shot his daughter, and his father was still in the upstairs in a different bedroom. He was reported to be bedridden, um, blind, hard of hearing. I was given the assignment of getting the elderly man out from an elevated position because they didn't want to put anybody on the stairwell because that's the location that the police officers were getting fired upon. Got the ladder truck there. I uh, had Lieutenant Prosser dispatched with Engine 26. There were still shots being fired when we, when we showed up to execute the plan for putting the ladder company to the window. Never had experience like that with a, you know, like a SWAT standoff, but we don't really do extracurricular activities with SWAT, so we were kind of just, you know, happened to be here and happened to be sent out there. So our, so our command structure passed on to us when we got on scene that, hey, we have an elderly male that we need to evacuate from the second floor, not able to come down the interior stairs, not able to get to him with a team from the interior, so we're gonna have to do it from the outside. It really kind of hit when we pulled up. I put the truck in park, got out of the truck, and then there gunshots. So the plan was to take a stoke basket into the room from the window, grab the elderly gentleman, bring him out. The bedroom door was open to the hallway to the other bedroom door where the shooter was at, and he had free access to us if he wanted it. I uh, had a little change of plans. When we got to the window, he was standing there. And we had to very quickly, quietly remove the victim out of the second floor window into a Stokes basket. I know from training with the team that I do my job, they do their job. Their job is to keep us safe the best they can. Uh, so we, we trust them that uh, we can put our personnel in those situations knowing that they are undercover. They are being protected by the law enforcement, you know, that tactical team inside. 
uh, for us to affect a, a, a rescue. I'm tired just watching that. Firefighters Cake, Prosser, Abatiello, Schneeberger, Niehaus, and Seamer, please come up to accept your Valor Award. Line up. That's exactly <laughs> why. <laughs> Congratulations. You guys need your own TV show, 911 Colerain. That's amazing. Did you have anything else to do the rest of last year, or was that it? Cats in trees, or? No? OK. Our next honorees are Aaron Berkeley and Darby Rayback from the Newark Fire Department. Listen to the story of how they fought dense smoke and flames in their efforts to save a woman's life. The call came in a little before 6 a.m. 911, what's the address of the emergency? I got a fire in my house. And immediately, we got good information from dispatch that there was two victims in the residence. Uh, the husband was the caller. Are you the only one inside the house? Yeah, me and my wife. You're not able to evacuate the home? My wife's bedridden. Yeah, so we arrived on scene to see the spouse of the victim that was still inside, um, kind of running around tr trying to find somebody to tell them, tell them where she was at. Uh, meanwhile, we're noticing heavy smoke conditions coming out of the, the front of the house. Uh, we had fire blowing out of the back of the house and heavy black smoke pushing out of all the eaves of the residence. And Chief Decker advised me that when he arrived, he heard the wife in the residence screaming for help. And at the front door, I met the husband who had self-extricated. He told us that she was in a front room, living room basically, um, on a hospital bed. He looked numb. I think he was in shock. Um, and I'm sure he was, because I'm sure he was sitting there, heard his wife screaming for help, and he was helpless. I entered the building and the house through the front door and immediately encountered a heavy fire load and some possible entanglements and heavy black smoke banked down to the floor. So I continued on my search and immediately came up to the hospital bed. I climbed up on the bed. She wasn't there. And about halfway through, we, I was met with a lot of debris in the in the living room um, and then kind of noticed that it was different than normal debris, um, felt a soft body. And about that time, I heard Aaron holler that he had found her hand. I would assume in panic that she tried to at least get on the floor below, below the smoke. And then by the time we got in there, the smoke was down to the floor. And the condition of her was unknown because we couldn't see anything. Um, just could tell that it was a victim. In the front yard, a medic crew was waiting to tend to her burns and respiratory distress. And then she was flown to OSU Burn Unit. Couldn't be more honored to, to be a part of this recognition event. 
uh, for Lieutenant Raybeck and, and Firefighter Berkeley. It's from dispatching all the way to the OSU burn unit. It's been a team effort, and I was just a small part of it. Aaron Berkeley and Darby Raybeck, please come up to accept your Valor Awards. Congratulations, gentlemen. Our third Valor Award winners, Aaron Polte, Michael McGuire, Stephen Swartz from the Toledo Division of Fire and Rescue in Port Clinton. They got way more than they bargained for when they showed up to fight a fire. Yeah, I need a fire station. Ten oh one. Sorry, I'm new now. The place is on fire. I was on engine six as the officer that day. Arrived first on scene uh, with Life Squad two right behind us. Uh, visually, what I saw was a person laying on the ground on the outside of the building. As I walked by him, he said he's jumped out of the building. There was an exterior stairwell um, that went directly to the second floor and we located two police officers. They said that when they got there, there was somebody that just jumped out of the second floor window and that there was somebody else inside that they could actually hear, that they were in verbal contact with the potential victim. They could hear somebody upstairs screaming. We went past the police officers. And we actually found him relatively quick because he kept talking. And uh, once we found him, you know, we busted open the door, uh, got it off the hinges. I think we heard something like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and uh, I, Steve and I said, let's just go. Steve had kicked that door, the guy was kind of behind the door, it was a small bathroom. We tried to get him up, uh, come to find out um, he was having difficulties even breathing. He said that he couldn't breathe. I said, no sh you're in a fire. Then he goes, no, I've been shot in the chest. And then we're like, uh-oh. Something, something else is going on. By squad two, we have a shot victim here in front. We brought him outside in front of the structure, and um, both Private Schwartz and McGuire went back in to help with extinguishment efforts. It was one of those things that, yeah, there's a thought process that goes through your head that, yeah, maybe the shooter's still in the building. So you're not really thinking about if it was an ambush situation. Um, you're more or less thinking about I have to help my crew out. If the police knew about it right away and they told us, maybe we would have changed tactics and waited. But at that time, it was more of a blessing that we didn't know and didn't have to have that in our heads. It's one of those probably one in a million runs. I'd say like a Hollywood moment. You know, the fire's rolling across the ceiling. Somebody's shot, there's a shooter in the building. My reasoning for putting these three individuals in is I believe that they made a personal decision, a group decision, and put themselves at risk. Uh, knowing that they may not come out of that building either. Um, and that is, to any of us, somebody that takes courage to do. But in this situation, once we added all the other incidents, parts of the incidents together with the shooting and all that, it was a little bit more than just a regular fire scene. I'll say, I think that's the first time we've had somebody bleeped during one of those videos. <laughs> Aaron Pulte. Michael McGuire, Stephen Swartz, please come up and accept your Valor Awards.
Congratulations, gentlemen. I mean, that's like something straight out of TV, like Chicago Fire or something. You're right, it was a Hollywood moment. Our fourth Valor honorees, Nick Tumino and John Tomlinson of the Westlake Fire Department, risked life and limb to save a life. Westcom 2, units responding to Stone Court per Westlake PD. They are on scene there, confirmed working fire. They state there is one occupant in the house. When we got there, there was a little chaotic scene, fire showing from the back of the house. And I remember John getting out and grabbing the line. He went to the front door. I came around to help John out. I was grabbing the rest of the hose off. And as I'm doing that, we hear the cops yelling towards us that, uh, you know, you guys got to get in there. You got to help him. He just was yelling for help, and now, we, you know, we haven't heard anything from him. Uh, luckily, they knew he was on the second floor somewhere. I run up to the front door, and John's getting messed up. I'm right behind him. I tell him to go. And I'm, I, still have, I still have to put my gloves on and everything like that, but I figured, you know, seconds matter. He of the moment. I just, we just went in. So I'm going up the steps thinking that it wouldn't be an issue. You know, and it's definitely really hot in there. Start feeling my hands burn. So we start making our way upstairs, and that is, uh, that is some heat that, that I don't, never really experienced before. It was so hot. I can't believe that there was anybody even talking up there because it was so hot. You know, stuff was melting off the walls, couldn't see anything. The flashover was imminent with the heat that was going on. And then uh, we went ahead and opened the doors to the master bedroom. And I'm looking in through the doors, and I can, I can see a little bit of light, but it's still, still like super smoky. So I start yelling out for Dan. I said, hey, Dan, Dan, can you hear me? And then I can see uh, a, a, a figure, like a shadowy figure, just stand straight up, and it's Dan. <laughs> and uh, he's like, you got to help me. You got to help me. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so it is so hot in there. It is, I mean, it is ridiculous. And he stands up, and after knowing what just happened with my hand just down on the first floor, I mean, we thought, like, his lungs and, you know, he's bad news then. Um, so as we're going down the stairs, he ended up kind of breaking away from Nick and I as we're bringing him down the stairs, and he ended up falling down, like, maybe, like, five stairs. We were lucky enough that uh, there was already a crew right there at the door, so they just came right in, pulled him out, and brought him right out, outside and got him onto the lawn. After seeing what the conditions were and seeing him, it, we didn't, the outcome it was unbelievable, you know, because of the, it, we thought there was so much airway injuries, but he ended up having a great recovery from it, and we got to meet him, and he's, he's a great guy. You know, I, I couldn't be more proud of, of John and Nick. They did an awesome job, I mean, it was, extreme conditions, you know, it's, they'll tell you it was it was hot in there. Uh, for Mr. Deegan to come out of this as well as he has is just fantastic. You know? So for me, I'm just very proud of all the guys that, that I work with, they were able to perform in such a high stakes situation. Dan Deegan is a very lucky man that he had these gentlemen there to help him out. Nick Tumino, John Tomlinson, please come up and accept your Valor Awards. Congratulations, gentlemen. <laughs> Kevin, is it my imagination or are firefighters getting younger and cuter? Whatever you want it to be. All right, thank you. <laughs> Good answer. And now we Springfield Fire Rescue Division. Derek, Shen Derek Shenfield, Kevin Whalen, Nicholas Wolliver, Colton Harsh with our fifth Valor Award. Their daring rescue and the life they saved was one of their own. I'm a structure fire, rescue one, engine five. Rescue one arrived first, identified a working structure fire. It was full smoke, you couldn't see it like normal. We work in the dark. Conditions uh, began to change. Uh, we noticed that it was uh, increasingly getting hotter. While pulling ceiling, 
Uh, we were met with heavy heat and uh, some rollover flame over our heads. We, we all felt our gear get saturated uh, much faster than usual, so we knew we, we had a problem that was getting hot quick and we couldn't find the seat of the fire. I decided that we were going to um, exit the second floor. Well, once we exited the structure, we realized that we had bigger problems is that I was missing somebody that was inside the house with me. And it was at that time that we received uh, an emergency uh, notification through our radio, uh, a man down feature on our radio. And the mic automatically opens up and we heard Rob's call for help. The battalion chief Fowl said, it's Rob, go get him. So, so Rob Mays is the senior firefighter on the division. He is one of those individuals that all of us look to, uh, to to gain experience, knowledge. When somebody is smarter than you and your mentor, how did they get themselves in trouble and how am I gonna get them out of trouble? And coming in, it was a steep stairwell and a real short landing at the top. And uh, so I wanted to make sure, this is, and I don't know why, but for some reason I wanted to be extra careful and feeling for the steps and then Next thing I know, I'm landed on my belly on the steps, and I slid down it like a sled. And when my head hit that landing at the back, my head kicked back. And it felt like lightning going down my back. But I couldn't move. I, I couldn't make my arm work to, to get to my mic to, to, to call for help. It was apparent that he was in a lot of distress. Rob's not that kind of guy to just call out for help. He's never like that. So for him to say that over the radio, I knew he was in some, some deep stuff. Without hesitation, they immediately went back on air. I think we all knew that time was not on our side. Clicked in my regulator about halfway through uh, the living room. And we find Rob face down at the landing of the stair. His eyes were just gazed off into the horizon. I couldn't, he wouldn't answer any of my questions or anything, so I knew that there was something seriously wrong. Myself and Captain Shinnefield grabbed Rob by his um, SCBA straps and began egressing the building with him. And as they're moving him out, right, they're stumbling and, and falling, and Captain Shinnefield's mask had become dislodged during that, uh, and so he was just, he was just eating the smoke. Um, upon uh, exiting the building, Captain Shenfield and I began to vomit. Just we were depleted, spent. Immediately when something like a May Day happens, uh, we had medics right there at the door, ready to help. So as soon as we got him out to the porch, medics completely took over. And I woke up out on the lawn, and I told him, I said, I think I broke my neck. I, uh, I need to go to Miami Valley, and I need the helicopter. And I had a surgeon named Nora Foster. She's the one that cut on my spine to keep me walking. Those guys there, they saved my life. And now I'm back here, ready to go back to work. And it's unbelievable, it's a, it's a miracle. I can't say thanks enough to everybody at that scene. My battalion chief on down. I love all them guys, they're amazing. And the stuff they did, unbelievable. That's why I'm here today. Rob Bass, you apparently trained your guys well. Derek Shenfield, Kevin Whalen, Nicholas J. Woolover, Colton W. Harsh, please come up and accept your Valor Awards. Just another day at the office. I know. <laughs> Let the Lieutenant Governor in, gentlemen. <laughs> Feasting every year, every year. 
The Distinguished Service Award is given to Ohioans whose leadership and accomplishments have served as a milestone and are widely recognized and respected in the Ohio Fire Service. This year we have two awardees. First up is Orville Buehrer, who's been a firefighter longer than most of us have been on this planet, serving the fire service for a staggering 72 years. I've been with the fire department 71 years, going on 72 this year. Chief uh, went down to our high school. He wanted to know if there any students who would like to be volunteer firemen. He asked me and I volunteered to be a fireman with the fire department. And him and his best friend, which happened to be my father-in-law, Bill Hyman, joined at the same time. And they uh, have been firefighters ever since. The way I became interested in it, when I was growing up in this town, two blocks to the south here, they had a fire. I was eight years old, and the Royce Coon elevator caught on fire at midnight, and the whistle blew, and I looked out the window, and I seen all them flames. It, it just interested me, you know, the way they had to fight fire back then. And it was a whistle and word of mouth. And uh, when I first got in the department, they had three telephones in town. They were located at three businesses. And when the call came in, the business person would run over to the siren box and sound the alarm. And, and then later on, we got uh, a phone system where we had 20 phones connected. When the call came in, you, you just listen in and then run to the station. You're on your way. <laughs> And Orville is still active. He uh, still shows up for a lot of training. Um, he will drive this big truck here on a fire call. Orville, over the years, has just been a good friend. And so I appreciate him so much for that. He's well committed to this organization and to the community. There's a lot of things I can do. I can still run the pumps and drive the truck. So I keep moving. And that's the whole secret to life is keep your body moving. Because if you don't move, you're, not, you're just going to wither away. Best advice ever. Just keep moving or you'll wither away. Orville Buehrer, please come up and accept your Distinguished Service Award. Congratulations. I can't imagine anything I like enough to do it for 70 years. We need to get bumper stickers. Keep moving or you'll wither away. We should all have t-shirts made that have that on it. Lieutenant Governor, would you get on that right? Yeah, take care of that. You know what? If we could get everybody to work till they're 88, we wouldn't have a workforce problem. <laughs> The preceding was a paid political <laughs> announcement. <laughs> okay. Alan G. Ketzel II is our second Distinguished Service Award recipient. See how he inspired legislation that protects firefighters to this day. I've been a firefighter for more than 60 years. No matter what time of day, night, that phone rings either for his work or the fire department, he gets up and goes. Many meals were missed. 
Uh, it was always a night that you had the best meal. <laughs> it wasn't a night that it was just soup and sandwich. My father w was involved in it uh, a little bit, and so I became involved in it. I grew up right across the street from, from the firehouse, and uh, every time the fire whistle would blow, I'd, I'd kind of watch what they do and so on. And that's how I really became involved, involved in it. Basically, we've known each other through high school. They started a, cad a cadet corps in 1958, and there was approximately 20 youngsters in, in the cadet corps, and we all kind of stuck together and so on. It, it was something to do for the community and so on. My dad was a person who was a servant of his community. He wanted to make where we lived the best possible place that it could be, whether it be for the fire service or for the city council that he served on. I was on the village council for 25 years, and now I'm a, I'm a fire safety inspector for the village. My father, who was previously state representative in uh, Eastern Ohio here. So with the relationship between Alan and my father, because they worked together, for decades in our Wilson funeral home. Basically, the, the, the funeral homes ran the ambulance service for the area, and it was very little rescue type uh, calls and so on. It was mostly transports, and that's how I got my start, staying there two nights a week. Alan Ketzel brought to my dad's attention um, the, the fact that many volunteer firefighters weren't willing to, to volunteer, weren't willing to get involved in, in fire service because they obviously their first obligation was to make a living, to hold a job. Alan brought this to the attention of my father, uh, who then took the legislation and the idea to the House of Representatives. Uh, they testified and passed the, passed the legislation, and House Bill 203 became law, protecting firefighters so they could not be terminated during fire service. I believe it's people like my father who deserves this award, and I'm greatly beneficial uh, for him to get this award. Alan G. Ketzel II, please come up and accept your Distinguished Service Award. Congratulations. The Ohio Fire Service Instructor of the Year Award honors an Ohio Fire Service Instructor who has demonstrated outstanding teaching characteristics. Characteristic. There are like words that, even when I was anchoring, I just couldn't say them without spitting all over the place. Teaching characteristics and has made a major impact on fire education in the fire department and local fire charter. So let's learn more about Ralph W. Long Sr., a teacher of so many generations since 1974. There was a parade in Ada, Ohio. Sitting on the curb watching the parade, the local fire department come by, the chief said, hey, get on there, I need to talk to you. Got on the truck and he said, you're working in town? Yep, you're on the fire department. So in 1974 is when I started in the fire service. I've been there ever since. I'm still a volunteer at the same department. Uh, we lived three doors from the fire station. We grew up around it. Uh, he drove a truck for a long time, then he got into the fire service as a fire investigator and fire inspector. So always growing up, you know, dad and grandpa were huge into the fire service, seeing them on the departments and runs and watching them in the papers and hearing all their stories. You know, you sit down at dinner and it's just full of all these amazing stories of things they've done and things they've seen and 
you know, this brotherhood that they get to be a part of. 2006, I came to Apollo just to help with maintenance. Uh, the man in charge at that time said, uh, why don't you become an instructor? I had a 36-hour certificate, so I could only train 36-hour candidates. The man in charge said, you need to get your level one. So at 62 years old, I took my level one. So I could teach level one. Kind of hard, an old man. But I used it in my teaching, if I can do it, 25 year old, old ought to be able to do it. You can learn a million things from that man. He'll never stop teaching. And I actually got to go through class with my dad and my grandpa. They're just passing on so much information. And it's amazing. He works great with the students. And, and they walk away learning, uh, whether it's the fire investigation or fire ground operations, or whatever the topic may be that he is teaching. You can't ask for a better instructor knowledge at a local educational facility. You're getting someone that should be teaching on the national level. Keep people safer, keep people more knowledgeable. And you know, he just wants to pass it on. You, you give him an ear, he'll teach you, he'll tell you anything he knows. He wants all of us to be better. You grow up seeing that and you want to be a part of it. Ralph W. Long, Sr., please come up and accept your Ohio Fire Service Instructor of the Year Award. Congratulations. Three generations of firefighters, I love that. The Ohio Fire Officer of the Year Award honors an Ohio fire officer who has demonstrated outstanding leadership characteristics and has made a major impact on the fire service at the local and regional level. This year, that person is Dallas Terrell, a man who leads by example with compassion and who inspires his team. We're talking about Dallas Terrell, Chief Terrell, one of the best in the industry in the area. Um, he's done so much for us as a community, um, or I should say as a county in general. Dallas cares deeply about the people here at this organization, the people at the training facility, and, and the community as a whole. The people that we're serving, uh, you can tell. Um, he's always that person, he's always there, he's always available, and always someone that people are looking up to. I really uh, sense compassion from him. Uh, you know, you cannot do this job very long or very long successfully if you don't have compassion for the people that you're serving and the people that are uh, you're working alongside with. Wayne County um, suffered some tremendous loss um, last April. Um, we had a firefighter killed in the northern part of the county. Um, our regional training facility director passed away very unexpectedly. Um, with our, within our department, we had a, a young guy, young kid that was killed um, all within a 24 hour, 36 hour time period. Dallas was directly involved with each one of those, making sure that the departments had what they needed. Um, people needed to talk, he was there to talk to them. Um, he covered our station for us while we were out dealing with the loss in our community um, and was there for our guys when some of us were out doing other things. No matter what he has on his plate, if you ask him for help, and even before you ask him for help, he's, he, he is there and ready to assist and help you with, with whatever you need. That was tremendous for what he did for us through that time of need. I'm humbled to be part of a team that does such great things that people recognize the good work that everybody does and I'm just happy that uh, I'm happy I can do my part. I've been very blessed here at Worcester Township Fire Department to be surrounded by a great group of people and at the Wayne County Regional Training Facility a fantastic group of instructors that are very dedicated and passionate about what they do and they're great at their job. This has been years upon years of buildup. He just outperforms all the others on a day-to-day -day basis, and he's always willing, always available, always able, 
and gives the solid advice, the solid knowledge to everybody that he's obtained through the years, and everybody looks up to him for that. Worcester Township is lucky to have you. Dallas Terrell, please come up and accept your Ohio Fire Officer of the Year Award. Congratulations. <laughs> the Ohio Fire Educator Lifetime Achievement Award honors an Ohio fire educator who has demonstrated innovative, outstanding teaching characteristics and has made a major impact on the field of the fire service at the local, regional, and national level. Meet Mark A. Mance, one of the best and brightest and the Ohio Fire Academy's very own. Mark Manch was the leader of a group of, of men uh, who, who taught search and rescue. I always liked search and rescue. That was my favorite. Uh, that was kind of my baby. That's pretty much the bread and butter of what we do. Actually, I got started out here um, being what they call a fueler. Basically just started throwing pallets, building fires, the students go and put them out, and then graduated up to classroom teaching, search and rescue, forcible entry, there were some officers that I worked with on Columbus that were out here, and they asked me to come out, and that's really how I got my start. You know, they thought enough of me that I had something to offer. Back then, we had to do several hours of observation, and I did probably two or three times as much uh, observation time as I had to, just because I wanted to be around these guys. Every day I came in, it wasn't just about teaching with them, it was about learning from them every day. And Mark's passion for the, the job and for the instructor, he was so driven and set such high expectations, he held the students a very high standard. I've always been more hands-on and, uh, you know, just had that ability to pass that information forward in a positive manner. That's the most important part. That knowledge needs to be spread. Because if you keep it to yourself, it, it serves no purpose. His correction matter was very much like a, a drill sergeant, but he amplified and he showed them why afterwards. Such an intense instructor. And we've actually had students uh, relay back to us after they've left and been on the job, where it's actually techniques and what they learned here through his leadership of their cadre save lives of firefighters and Ohioans. I'd, I'd very much like to say thanks to the fire marshal, the OFA staff, um, the great instructors I got to work with through the years. Uh, it's really a humble and honoring uh, experience. I, I never dreamed that I would even be considered for it and it is a great honor. Congratulations, Mark, on behalf of the Ohio Fire Academy, a very well-deserving instructor, and he's impacted generations of firefighters, and we won't even know how, many, how much impact he's, he's had on the fire service. Mr. Mance could not be here today, so we will accept the award on his behalf so that when he does show up, he can share it with all the rest of the Mance maniacs. I love that sign. But let's go ahead and applaud him anyway. It is time now for the award for Ohio Fire Department of the Year. Now this award honors an Ohio Fire Department that has demonstrated outstanding teaching characteristics and because of these attributes has made a major impact in fire education in their community and their department. This year, the award goes to a deserving department in the Oxford area that also performed some Rather unusual rescues. We're talking about the Riley Township Fire and EMS.
it was started in 1947. It's volunteer, still volunteer today. We have roughly 34 members right now. Uh, we run uh, three engines, two tankers, three squads, two brush trucks, rescue truck, and a gator. Numerous runs with uh, large animal, cattle, and horses. We've actually had a horse in a well in Germantown. And when we get a run like that in our phones, we have a narrative, and it'll say what, what one we're going to. And it said, blind horse in a well. And you're thinking, that can't be real. But this is exactly what it was. And I remember it very vividly. We walked up to it, and there was a full-grown horse, and the horse was completely submerged up to his neck, and just his front hooves and his mouth were sticking out. Um, and that was just a surreal moment to see that and to figure out how are we going to get this horse out alive, uninjured. And we do a lot of large animal lifts for a lot of these equestrian places that have their horses go down and can't get up. So my dad was the spearhead of creating the large animal rescue unit, so I've been in it from the get-go. We saw it as a need-based. Almost immediately after they got certified, we had a cow stuck in an old manure lagoon. So he saw not just a need around here, from other horse people he knew. We got called in to Ross Township for a man that was trapped in a grain bin. And they called in the county units. Uh, we arrived with our grain equipment. So we have special mats that are this thick and they're squares and you lay them around the uh, uh, patient so we can stand in there. And then we've got miniature augers that we put down and auger the corn away from them so they can start breathing again and the grain is not pressing on their chest where they can't get air. And then we also have harnesses and stuff to harness them up with so that they don't go no deeper in the grain. What I'm so proud of is the amount of volunteers we have and how dedicated they are to the people of the township. Everybody is short of people and we seem to get people every month. We could have as high as 12 to 15 people on a run. And a structure fire, we're liable to have as many as 30. 2013, we got Volunteer Department of the Year, which we're extremely proud of, but the fact that we're acknowledged as a Department of the Year, not specifically Volunteer, and we're extremely proud. And you should be. I love this fire department. Ladies and gentlemen, the Riley Township Fire and EMS, would you please come up and accept your Ohio Department of the Year Award. You guys need your own cable TV show. Large Animal Rescue. I love it. That is definitely a niche area. Congratulations. Congratulations to all our winners. And that does wrap up the awards presentation section of our ceremony. How about a round of applause for all our honorees today? And now he heart throughout this program sneaked up on the sneaked up on the stage before I got a chance to bring him up so I'm going to bring him up again. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Ohio will share a few words with us today. Lieutenant Governor? <laughs> Well, good afternoon. Um, as I think you know, I'm John Husted. I'm the Lieutenant Governor. I was with this Governor just before this. Governor DeWine sends his regards. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, the opportunity to share uh, the afternoon with you and to learn about what all of you are doing and the special level of service that you've provided. Um, my, my team knows that I, I say this a lot, 
we should celebrate what we value. And it's important that we have events like this to celebrate valor and longevity and honor and hard work and service. It's important for every society to honor the things that it values because it sends a lesson. I hope to the honorees it sends a, it sends a message to your family about how much the world cares about the work that your mom and dad do or your son or daughter or your loved one. I hope uh, it sends a message to the next generation when they read about this in the media and maybe they meet you, that this is important. What you do is important. It's an important service that saves lives, um, saves loved ones, um, makes a difference in people's world every day. And that they learn from that, that they learn that there's virtue in service. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I thought I witnessed, and Andy touched on this a little bit in his remarks, is not just the love of service and the love for your community, but the love and the bond that you have with each other. Uh, it is special, and I hope that as we honor this service and as other people see that, and particularly the next generation of young people, that they see the bond and the value and the virtue of service. And so I appreciate you letting me be part of that today. Um, you are indeed setting an example for others. I know that there is a lot of risk in what you do, and we thank you for that. Um, I've watched it in the videos I've seen. I know that we watched it in East Palestine earlier this year. We've seen it in every community in the state, whether there is a fire an accident, an emergency of some type, a natural disaster, uh, you are the ones that come to the rescue, literally and figuratively. And um, I want to celebrate, I think today is a, is a moment we can celebrate the work of all 50,000 dedicated men and women who serve in Ohio's fire services. You all represent different communities from small volunteer fire departments, which I've gone out on some runs with you, to big, major cities uh, that experience a completely different kind of experience. But all of it is important to the people of your community. And um, an event like this shines a light on your courage and your dedication and your sacrifice, your personal risk that you put yourselves through. Um, but to me, uh, honoring you is important for all of us and sending that message to the rest of the world that we honor your service. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll conclude with this thought. Um, I, believe you get, I believe you get purpose in your life from four works. Your work, your vocation, your family, your faith, and your community. And I bet everything that when you're nearing the end of your life and you get a chance to reflect on everything that has happened, that there's nothing that doesn't fall into one of those four buckets that has meaning for you. And when we honor that service and community and your brotherhood and sisterhood and the work, that sends the message to, message to others about how important what you do is to giving purpose and meaning in your life, your lives, and how it has purpose and meaning for others. So thank you for your dedicated service and may God bless you and your families in every step you take from this day forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. And now Chaplain Larry Fall join us again to deliver this again to deliver the benediction and the benediction and then we'll have some housekeeping duties to take care of. Chaplain.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we humbly ask that you bless each individual as they go from this place. Keep them safe. Bless their efforts. Protect them and cover them with your grace. And comfort all those who love them, the ones who must remain at home and wait for their safe return. We thank you for your provision, your protection, and your incomprehensible love. Bless the army of first responders, those in the fire service, those in EMS, those brave individuals who see their calling more important than their own safety as they personify Jesus' teachings. The greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay in his life for his friend. We ask God that you may be glorified in our service. And we ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much, Chaplain. Well, we want to invite all of you to stay for cake. There's a cake reception and fellowship with your fire service family. I want to personally thank Andy Ellinger, Michael Gravely, and Katie. Where is Katie? Katie over there for keeping me kind of sort of on track and indulging me. Thank you for inviting me back, you guys. I really appreciate it. And I do want to take this moment to personally thank the first responders of Ohio who do, as everyone up here has said, put their lives on the line for each of us every day. As I said at the beginning, firefighters are, are my favorite public servants. When I was a young reporter, I covered a ton of fires. And I was always amazed at the work that these men and women did and how, how selfless they were. I was amazed, I was impressed, but I think I fell in love with firefighters when I had my own fire. I had an apartment fire January 6, 1988. I got up to answer the telephone and I went back into my bedroom and my bed was on fire. So this fire had been cooking under my bed for I don't know how long. And it spread very quickly once I threw back the covers of my bed and the bed just kind of went whoosh. Well, I was freaking out. I did have the presence of mind to call 911 and it was amazing to me how quickly the fire department showed up. I don't remember a lot of that day because I was in shock and I just thought if the phone had not rung and I had not got up out of bed to go answer the phone, I would not be standing here in front of you right now. I watched these men and women put out my fire, and it wasn't just another fire, it was my fire. And that's when I realized how personal these kinds of disasters and tragedies can be, and how much you learn to appreciate, and yes, even love, the men and women who come to help you in your time of need. So I personally thank each and every one of you for everything that you do to make and keep us safe, and then to get us the hell out of there when we're not safe. Thank you, I appreciate that. With every emergency call, they respond without question. Undoubtedly, one year from today, we will honor a new group of heroes who have gone above and beyond the call of duty. They have a motto at the State Fire Marshal's Ohio Fire Academy, everyone goes home. This goes beyond the fire service. It is for all the citizens of the great state of Ohio. So please be safe out there on each and every call and shift and return home safely. So to all of you here today, many of you have come from all around the Buckeye State. Please have a safe drive home. We love you. We care about you. And all of you firefighters, EMTs, we especially Go forth, eat cake.